Live from Bedford Falls, this is Derailed Trains of Thought. Welcome, folks, to episode 62 of Derailed Trains of Thought. This is a nice place. I like this. It is a very cheery we, look, place. We had a shop around the corner. Now we have this nice town all dressed for Christmas, lots of snow and trees everywhere. The podcast has been kind to it us has lately. Been kind to, it has been It's in a festive mode. It is in a festive mode. And uh, it's funny, though, this, this town, a second ago, I thought it looked very different. Like there were, or it seems like there were a lot of showgirl places yeah, around. I, it, and, well, yeah, it was like I blinked and... It was a nice, a nice town. And there was that crazy guy that went ran, running by, like, you know, just, I mean, either he'd been drinking too much or he's really in the Christmas spirit. Yeah. But it's it's a quaint little place. Yeah, I like it. And um, although I feel a little underdressed, like everyone is walking around in, like, suits and fedoras. The podcast needs to start dressing us. That would be a good idea. Because yeah. we, we really stick out sometimes. <laughs> we do, especially that one time when we were at uh, Moss Eisley Cantina. Yeah. Well, everyone sticks out in Moss Eisley Cantina. Well, that's true. Um, we might have Star Wars on the mind. Yeah. I can't I, imagine why. Yeah, it's not like it's anywhere else. So. <laughs> Welcome, folks. If this is your first time listening to us, uh, this is Timothy Deal. This is Nick Hayden. And I'm the video guy. And I'm the writer dude. <laughs> and uh, we talk about stories a lot. Yeah. what we, How to write them, what we like in them, what you should do in them, what you <laughs> should not do in them. Basically. Yeah. All, all that. All the kinds of fun stuff. So should we just go ahead and dive into it? Yeah, our first section, which is... Story School. It's Christmas time of year, and Christmas time also often makes for some very memorable storytelling. And one of the key ingredients in a Christmas story, well, in any story really, but it it often shines at Christmas time is no this <laughs> is the setting. In the setting, because in a Christmas story, like here in Med- Bedford Falls, you have snow, you have trees and lights, and you have Christmas carolers, and well, that's not really a setting. Well, it kind of is, but but you you know you there's scenes that look Christmassy. Yes, you know. Uh-huh. And it and it completely changes the tone of a show, the tone of a book, and in in the best ones, it is a whole character, in many ways. You know, in setting way back when we talked about weather, as yes. a, as a part of a story, and we talked quite a lot about that actually. Yeah, I think that was like episode five. Really, we've come wow. a long way, or but, maybe it was six. I don't even remember. But we thought, well, we have to talk about something as basic as setting, especially setting as a character, as some, as a as an integral part. I mean, everything has setting. Sure, obviously. But <laughs> <laughs> unless you're nowhere, and then you're still in a setting. Yeah. But when nothing is a setting, ooh, dun dun. dun. That's, That's a whole podcast. But you know, so we thought we're Christmas things. We talked last year uh, for our Christmas episode a lot about a Christmas Carol. Yes. And London is a very uh, prominent setting. Well, it's you know that's Charles Dickens for you. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah, London is. Yeah, it has a life of its own. And I guess that's one area where you know different adaptations bring different things to the setting. Muppet Christmas Carol has this very kind of old feel. I mean, I guess they all try to feel old, but yeah. you know it. If well, unless you, it's a modern rendition. Well, yeah, if it, unless it's a modern rendition. But I don't know. There's something about the Victorian garb and then the the dirty of the streets that the really emphasize the poverty. of. And, and nowadays, just even outside of Chris, the Victorian feel and hold taste to a story. Yeah. Depending on the, you know, the genre. If it's Sherlock Holmes, you know, you might have dark, you know, alley streets yeah. and uh, there's hallways. Often, and there's often a sense of either... Depends on how you do it. The London setting can often, or that Victorian, it often lends itself to mystery, mm-hmm. to you know horror, because everything's lit by to, everything's lit by candles. Yeah, and, and everything just feels old, which to us feels mysterious. And I wonder if it would have me and I have the same feel. You know, obviously they didn't have TV back then, but you know they wouldn't have thought of it in maybe those terms as much. Because you know, did you ever watch Lincoln? No. Oh, oh, yes, yes. What was fascinating about that movie is how they use natural lighting the whole time. And, you know, it's just, it's a different feel when everything has to be lit by either yeah. firelight or windows or, or what have you. In the, the age of the electric light bulb, we, uh, we thrive in lots and lots of yeah. lights. That reminds me, Lincoln and then talking about Victorian is also, setting is very, one source where it's very important and is the, his, the historical movies. Hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, because for us, as modern people, 
that's something we really pick up on is the the garb and the way you know the way the rooms run and er, you know everything. You watch a Lincoln or you watch Downton Abbey or you know the mansion is it's a character. It's in a itself. character, yeah. Mm-hmm. And that I mean, I guess it goes without saying, but it is something that affects us differently than just running around in New York or something like that, right? Yeah, there, there's a sense of mystery, a sense of otherness. Well, and it's interesting too when we we've gotten more movies. There's been more movies that are set you know, in like mid to late 20th century that's starting to feel more dated to us, you know. Argo. Yeah, Argo, <laughs> the set in the 70s, you know. At one time, that wouldn't have been a period piece. Now no. it is. Yeah, 70s, you watch a movie like, man, they really did that. They hit the spot on sort of uh-huh. feel. And you know, I wasn't like, well, no, I wasn't like in the 70s, but still. Close. Close, <laughs> yeah. But it, it it is fascinating. I mean, that just shows you the march of time. And I mean, there's, a, there's a, definitely a feeling of, the more things change, the more they say the same. At the same time, looking at what was important during this period of history. Yeah. You know, what were the things that we were dealing with then? And that might be getting into a different uh, avenue than setting yeah. as like an atmosphere. Well, and then sometimes setting is, you know, just dictates your story to a certain extent. I was just thinking we watched um, Under Capricorn with Brian Churchill the other. And it's in Australia and it's just a different, it's not a story you would tell anywhere else. Because of the slave, what was going on then? Yeah, it was, yeah, that's true. Because you had like these people who were, who had been prisoners at one point, yeah. and you know this is still in the period where if you ever went to prison, that was you know you were done in terms of like society, yeah, you know high class society. But in Australia, it wasn't necessarily that way, and it was an interesting clash between those perspectives. And and the clash the setting works really well in in establishing clash. I watched this movie. I cannot remember the name of it. Bella, I want to say it's called. Recent or older? Relatively recent. Uh, it's about, a, I think it takes place in England. Daughter of a, s- like a slave and a nobleman. Okay. Gets adopted into the nobleman's family. And she has this, she's this black lady living in this English, you know, noble house. And has a lot of that discrepancy in classes and color and race and all this other stuff. But, you know, but sometimes she's there in the, in the ballrooms and stuff and, she feels like an odd person. It was it's based on a real story. Interesting. It was it was an interesting little movie. Okay. Well, we've we've I'm talked, sorry. Yeah, I'm all over the place. <laughs> no, we've talked a lot about the historical accuracy yeah. or historical setting. So, what are some some modern day settings that uh, are particularly you think are particularly effective? Hmm. I mean, I guess there's different ways you could look at this. You know, you talked about under Capricorn as not only a historical setting, but a, a geographical setting. setting. Yeah. And I guess that's something worth touching on, too. You know, location is is very important, not just when the time period it is or where it's at. But, um, you know, if you're, say, in the mountains, yeah. you know, that, that will have a different feel than, say, in the desert. Yeah. Like, well, I haven't, I've only seen parts of it, but there will be blood. Did you ever see that? I've not, no. I think... I think it's that one that that it's in the desert a lot, and there's, you know, anytime when you're in those things, there's usually a lot of grit, a lot of, um, I mean, depending on whether you're doing like, a, say, a survival story, yeah. then obviously it's about man versus the nature yeah. of your surroundings. But if it's not that, then it could be about, say, the the searchers, where the, yeah. w- there is that chase across the wilderness, and you kind of get this feel of uh, life is hard and tough, and only these men will who are hard and tough yeah. can survive it. And, th- and that's I think that's a good point, that in many ways, good writers and good movie makers use a saying to, to reinforce character traits, reinforce the sort of world view of the movie, in, in like deserts and mountains, you know, it's just this rough... Um, let's bring it up because we mentioned earlier Star Wars. Uh-huh. You know, very basic settings in the first movie. You've got a desert and then you have a each, ice. Each planet apparently has its own type of... Uh, uh, one landscape. biome. One bi- <laughs> With p- the possible exception of Naboo. Well, but that, see, that's interesting because obviously you get the desert and you feel you feel on the outskirts. Yeah. A band, you know... Middle of nowhere. Law, middle of nowhere. I mean, literally. Yeah. In many ways. And the desert really makes you feel that. Mm-hmm. And kind of grungy. You got the canteen and stuff. Right. And then by um, Empire Strikes Back, you're in ice and you got this, this... For a movie that's basically about being defeated, having this cold, hard, brutal setting to start in. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just... It looks nice, whatever. But it does it add to the sense of desolation. Yeah, yeah, you don't get the sense that uh, the rebels are really on top of the game when they yeah. have to settle in Antarctica. <laughs> no, exactly. And then yeah. and then when you get to like, you know, Naboo, Naboo's a very interesting choice because it is probably the most complicated 
but at the same it's, um, time, what what where do you see Naboo? It's always very lush wherever you look. And it's just interesting. So you start the you start the first movie of the whole thing, lush, good, kind of Garden Eden ish. Yeah, that's a good and point. And then it kind of falls apart. And then you end up in, well, Mustafar. Yeah. Um, very, very hellish. So, I mean, I really do think that even though they are in some ways just single biomes, you know, here's our volcano planet here, is that there are also chosen very specifically for the mood and the view of the story. I mean, we end, we start in a lush place and we end in Return of the Jedi in a relatively lush place. That's true. That's a, that's a very good point. And I guess, you know, if you want to extend the metaphor a little further in the prequels, you know, in uh, Attack of the Clones, you've got the clone planet is like turbulent seas. That's Un- true. Lots yeah. of, there's lots of uncertainty, lots of ups and downs. Is this, you know, what and, it, it- and it's interesting because inside it's very pristine and sterile and controlled. Mm-hmm. So it's like this is real life and the clones are like manufactured. And it's interesting because the second one has Naboo some of the time. And then you're also on Genosis, which is very deserty. Mm-hmm. So we have this two sides of Anakin and everyone else. I think in that, we, we read that... The, the ring theory? The ring theory in the essay. I think they talked about Lucas actually wanting like the first half of that movie to be very blue and the second half and then kind of fading into much more of a reddish. Speaking of... Set, with, with Tatooine, yeah. with a visit and Tatooine being kind of the a muted in yeah. between the two. So anyways, a way to you setting... No one's thinking that watching Star Wars. Oh, no. But I think it... It really does subconsciously play in. I mean, there's some movies that are, the setting's very obviously important. You know, sir, um, Castaway. Yes, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just, mm-hmm. it is. Gravity. Um, Outer space. Interstellar. I mean, right. Martian. Man, Martian. I mean, Martian is basically Castaway in space. <laughs> um, and it's good for the same reasons. So whenever you have a survival sort of thing, it's basically man versus the setting. Yeah, pretty much. But then there's other ways to do it where it, it just kind of creeps in. More subtly. I mean, it's still... Uh, I guess horror movies are traditionally very well known for using setting. That's true, like, yeah. You know, whether it's in a, a haunted house, whether you're in a psych ward or yeah. something, that horror movies rely on a very intimidating setting yeah. to really set the, or, the tone. Or occasionally juxtaposition, where you'll be That's in a true. nice mm-hmm. setting, but everything's messed up. Yeah, usually involving like children's toys or something. That, <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. They, they love twisting the childhood innocence thing to something like grotesque. I mean, I suppose you could very easily take one movie, you know, say you took the beginning of Star Wars and you moved it instead it was on that, instead of Tatooine, it was on Dagobah. You know, it was a swamp planet still in the middle of nowhere. It wouldn't work the same. It, it'd be a different feel because, like, part of the idea with Dagobah is not just that it's in the middle of nowhere, but it's still like in the swamp. You have these. You'd be stuck. It's like you're stuck, and you've got this this feeling of uh, life kind of interconnecting because there's still actually a life in the swamp. Exactly. Yeah, and and there's just there's Tatooine's a dead end. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. What do they call it in one of the books somewhere? I think the armpit of the galaxy. <laughs> but nice. yeah. Setting uh, okay, I just uh, for the, for the bingo people. Okay, so lost. Uh, <laughs> I just had to pull it in. But again, a long term use of setting mm-hmm. as mystery. Yes, because this, so, you know there are places where setting is mystery, and that is something interesting you can do with the island in that it's this one location, you know, kind of isolated from the rest of the world by itself and with lots lots of nooks and crannies to explore. And you have a lot, you know, you'll have places, castles in different stories, whether it's fancy or gothic, will often have... Castle in the sky. Castle, yeah. You'll, you'll you know, you'll explore, J- even Jane Eyre, you know, you run around in this gothic sort of place and there's noises and there's some, you find there's an old lady or a crazy lady in the attic and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm not that familiar with Jane Eyre. Oh, I didn't okay. know there was that, a mystery Well, that's his it. wife, yeah. Oh, okay. But she's insane. Bizarre. Um, but, you know, and gothic literature relies on setting very heavily. Oh, sure. That's uh, one gothic story. What, what was that one? Uh, House of Memories. From what, mine? What? I think so. Yeah. It, when they're, they're stuck in the house. He's stuck in the house. He can't get out, and there's that noose there. No, no, no. no, no. Well, that, I, I could see that. But there was... Uh, Dinner at Twilight. Oh, Dinner at Twilight is also very setting oriented. Yeah. Yeah. That's a flash fiction you can find on my website, worksofnick.com. <laughs> Look at Would, that. Yeah. And it's very, promo. very yeah. smooth there. Um, but yeah, I think setting as mystery is very, a very interesting way because again, sometimes setting is conflict, like mm-hmm. a survival thing, mm-hmm. setting as kind of backing up your, your subconscious themes, mm-hmm. like our Star Wars example, and then setting as mystery, as, and not quite conflict, but, you know, 
the tension, the the where the plot comes from, even though it's not itself a plot. Mm-hmm. Uh, just be I want to throw in here, like um, Heaven Sent from Doc, the recent Doctor Who series. Yes, that yeah. castle is the set. The setting is that is a very gothic type yeah. setting, and it was it was very effective. If you want to hear us fawn about that episode, <laughs> you'll check out the <laughs> weekly hijack. Hi- about weekly it. hijack. Yes. <laughs> See the sidebar on our do real trains of thought dot blogs plot dot com. <laughs> Another plug, man. We're I know. Doing I'm, good I'm trying to be good at this this time. <laughs> But yeah, Heaven Sent, that was a great episode. Okay, let's go into more, because we talked about some of these big picture ideas. Yeah. So let's go into some more realistic ones. Okay. Because um, I don't know you've done this. Yeah, I guess you could say you've done it with Vienna a little bit. Yeah. But using a city as a, as a setting, would there be a particular story that would work better in, say, Chicago than it would in Detroit, Detroit. Or, hmm. or New York? I mean, New York does, at least in America, have this very distinct sense that the only other city that comes close to having such a distinct character is probably L.A. in in the popular imagination. In the popular mind, yeah, that's probably true. Um, New York is just the center of all things. Well, yeah, it's it's a hu- It's the biggest city in, in the United States. It gets lots of immigrants. It's a huge melting pot. Well, it's and then a culture in of, of itself. And I think I think worldwide you have a few other cities like that. I mean, Paris. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you want any sort of romantic tension, not you know, just instant romance. You just show the Eiffel Tower and you're set, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That's true. London to a certain extent. Not like, not for romance, but uh, uh, it for just, rain. It just made me made me think. Oh yeah, that's true. Or uh, in Muppets Most Wanted, and Constantine's like, "We'll have our wedding at the most romantic place, the Tower of London." <laughs> <laughs> nice. So ironic use of setting, I yeah, suppose. Yeah. <laughs> um, are there other? You you starting to get this sort of. Especially in spy things like Dubai, sort of a mm, an exotic, exotic, ex- rich. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, that's also the one with a desert, like right outside too. Yeah, right? it's a very interesting. Yeah, so that's got some of the exotic and it's kind high of class. Different. It's just, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, a lot of European cities you're gonna see in say a Bond movie. Yeah, very swank and yet feeling very old at the same time. Well, like like Venice is a Venice, great one to put yeah. in for feeling old and cultured and yeah. Or uh, I remember in Porco Rosso, they're on the Adriatic, and they talk about Milan a lot. And I don't, I you kind of fall in love with that little corner of the Mediterranean yeah. for, through that movie. It just seems very romantic and old. You know, it's it's like in the inner war period, yeah. I think. So it just feels lush. You know, another another I, I can't quite define the sense of it. Tokyo has a very distinct sense in movies and stuff as well. In anime, mm-hmm. and then it's a sense of very techno technologically connected and very on the edge of things. Uh I don't know what else. I mean, it's kind of like New York. It is. It well, and but it also has this much older feel to it, which is partly you know the Japanese being a very old culture. Yeah, and using like That's I mean, true because you have you have you know like the palace right in the middle of, and they Tokyo. have you know they'll have their shrines yeah. in, in various places, and and plus I keep and, thinking they're like the, that Japanese Times Square, you know, the, with the big street and uh huh. And I don't know. Anytime I watch anime that's set in a Japanese city, you know modern Japanese city, it always seems like they're building around hills and like they have very unusual, like all the houses are close together and it's just, it seems very unusual streets. Like yeah. they have like got a lot more hills and stuff than say New York would. So yeah, Tokyo def- as a city definitely has, an, has a character of its own. That was interesting. We've been talking about setting, you know, you're the video guy and the writing guy. The video setting comes off is much easier in some ways. I mean, it's just, it's a whole different beast than writing setting. Sure. Because the video setting, you know, you always start your movie, you're panning over the city. And landscapes. Landscapes, and, and you just, you see the green. What, And, you know, you got you have a Tolkien sort of person who uh, can, you know. In a book, those are the things that a lot of people just kind of skip over or skim over. Yeah, and I, don't, and I think you can do it, but it's, you know, to not do it literary in the sense of, you know, like, and you can, some people do it very well literary. Mm-hmm. But to kind of just interweave it, I think you just have, you have to work in those, you know, those kind of basic words like, light and shadow and busy and empty and stuff like that. And you can almost paint broad strokes of a setting pretty effectively in writing. But I think in some ways it's almost easier in, or we're most, I guess we're more used to it in video. Yeah, it, it's more easily identifiable, I think, in film and, yeah. and, and that stuff. I mean, again, because of the landscapes and stuff. That and 
this may just be me because I'm kind of lazy when it comes to setting probably my own writing. Yeah. I've, it's not something I, I can say I've really done a whole lot. Um, well, I will say in terms of like locations, I really, yeah. I really thought a lot about what say Crom was as a town yeah. in my novella New Orleans Rising. That whole chapter was basically my excuse to kind of shoehorn a western in there. Yeah, I mean that's that's basically what I did with Crom. But the thing about screenwriting is that because you're consciously also thinking about where are they going to shoot this thing, I think it also encourages you to think more about the setting as a, um, you know, what does it mean? You know, Yeah, because it's a, it's a very visual medium. Yeah, and in New Wells Rising, I don't know that I use, like, say, time of day or weather or mm-hmm. even the wilderness. You know, they had to cross the wilderness. It was a trek, but I didn't really, I didn't have any deep meaning behind yeah. it. It was just because we had this world set up and this is what they had to do. Yeah. You don't always have to bend your story to fit a particular setting. Yeah. Set, yeah. I mean, if if the if what you need to happen in the story doesn't really matter, then don't if worry about it. If anything will do, you know, you know, it's just it's like an X Files. Yeah. Some small city somewhere will work. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> in that case, you know, if if you don't want your setting to be d- too distracting, don't make it distracting. But if you have the opportunity to have it, you know, add a new flavor mm-hmm. to it, to add a little bit of meaning of you know, like I said, even thinking about what city your story could be set in, that's, you know, that's a whole nother element. Well, and for some, a lot of people, you know, especially we, we tend to be more fantastical writers, you know, spectral of fiction sort of stuff. But mm-hmm. a lot of people write much more grounded. They like to write in a city they know. Like, I oh, know sure. these streets. I know these people. You know, it's something. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, that. As opposed to, you know, that's what uh, Cobblestones was. Vienna. Yeah, um, and that was the one I was thinking about earlier. That was the a, a town that you... you it's know, basically you, based on my hometown. Kinderville. And yeah. so it's like, it's something you knew. And I like putting stories occasionally. Because it's very seldom, actually, I write stories in a place I actually know. <laughs> For me, a lot of people like, you know, that's what they write all the time. Like, oh, it's, this, it's based on this city or that city or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's actually kind of a new thing for me. That's an interesting point. Because I was thinking of another city that might ha- at least is known of having a particular character is, say, Seattle. It's sort of known in culture for being kind of rainy yeah. and kind of angsty and lots of coffee shops and yeah. punk, or not punk, but, you know, indie metal and stuff. Yeah. Indie stuff. But I've never actually been there myself. I don't really know the culture. You know, I might just be making lots of assumptions. Yeah. You know, that might be something that you would want to go to a city to research and, you know, kind of really get a feel for the culture yeah. of the place. Um so there's all that. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded very convincing, Tim. <laughs> no, but I, I do think um, setting's not always my first thing writing-wise, but sometimes it can be really neat to build a nice, you know, a neat city or a neat, neat you know, I had to do it for Jalcee and for Children Wells. You mentioned Chrome. Mm-hmm. Jalcee was like, okay, I got to make this technocratic city and how would it work and everything. And mm-hmm. it's nice to do that occasionally if it's not something you do a lot, I think, and set, figure out, hey, how can the story be rude inside setting I tend to come up with characters and find places for them. I just would find a place and put characters in them. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I do have to credit John Baylor lent me a book called Invisible Cities. Oh, have you read it? He was telling me about it. It sounds cool. Yeah, it, it is It is very cool. And I think that's actually what made... I was thinking of that subconsciously when I was writing about Chrome and what was the other town? Aldenstam in that, yeah. in that thing. Because, I mean, it's basically just a collection of like each chapter is just a collection of a city. It's like a page or two. Just to kind of describe the city. Just right? kind of describing the city. I I guess the the conceit is Marco Polo is talking to Genghis Khan about all these places he's visited in yeah. his travels along the way and what the identity of, the, of each town is like. That's basically the entire book. I don't remember the author's name. It's it's an Italian book, I think. Yeah, because John told me about this book. I'm like, that sounds really interesting. I should go hunt that down. Yeah. He lent it to me. I, hope I, I mean, that's a book that's basically setting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I hope I don't still have it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, a famous Ray Bradbury story. I can't even remember what it's called. There will come soft rains. The entire story is basically this house, this automated house that just keeps doing its thing even though everyone's been killed by a nuclear blast. Oh wow. And so it's just it's just setting. It's the whole pl- the whole story, which you don't get very often. Yeah. The uh, so the setting is the character literally. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's really interesting to you know on that extreme of things because a lot, of, you know, some writers are very plot or very character. Mm-hmm. You don't always get people who are very setting. Tolkien to a certain extent was yeah, <laughs> setting <laughs> um, some other people. But it's a very interesting focus, I guess. Mm-hmm. Things like Hatchet. Yeah. So, 
Right. Cool. I think that was fun. So definitely think about it. Maybe think about it a little bit more next time you're writing a story. Or just try a short story. Be like, I'm just going to just write about the setting. <laughs> it's. I think it'd be an interesting experiment. Yeah. Well, that is our story school for today. So that means it's time to move on into soundtrack. Dun, dun, dun. Nick, were you going first? Here? I will go first today. Yes. So there's this uh, remixer you may have heard of named Maze Dude. Do tell. Yes. Maze Dude um, has only awesome songs. But anyways, this is a kind of a, a upbeat, semi-wintry song from um, Ice Climbers. Is that the name of the game? I guess just Ice Climber, singular. Ice Climber. Aren't there two of them? Well, there are two in Smash Brothers. Okay. Um, there is a, according to the title screen here, there is like a first player and a second. Okay. You can have up to two players. Anyways, this is uh, a remix from Ice Climber named um, Snow Cone Heaven. It's just kind of fun and um, enjoyable and slightly wintry since we're talking in setting. So enjoy.
are back. Hopefully you enjoyed yet another Maze Dune. We've listened to a number of them here. That is a v- particularly fun one. Yeah. And, and an older one, too. But, yes. But always a good one. I guess then, Tim, we'll go to our next section. Yes. That will be our take on Tales. Okay, so we have a kind of uh, interesting idea for this one. We had a couple things that we thought maybe we'd talk about. So, you know, last year we did kind of a November wrap up of movies, and there weren't, there was no Interstellar this year. So no, so we don't have a long, long discussion of things. <laughs> so, what we thought we'd do instead is we're going to hit a, a bunch of stuff here. We're going to talk about a couple movies. We're going to talk about a couple TV shows because we're kind of in the mid season break yep. at the moment. But here's the, the trick because we have something else we want to do afterwards. Only two minutes per topic. We got a timer going here. So uh, we'll see if we can manage. We tend to. We'll see if we can manage. Yeah. I'm, it may not literally be two minutes because I'll probably edit out some stuff. Oh, okay. Possibly. Okay. But for us, close. it'll be two minutes. So, Tim, all right. all Mockingjay. Yes, Go. Yes. Mockingjay. <laughs> uh, let's see. This one, it was interesting because I've said this one is darker and yet not as dark in some ways as the book. Now, you haven't read the book, actually, no. have you? And no. you didn't see this movie. I haven't seen the movie either, so I'm... it's For shame. Movie. But it was funny. I actually, I went to see this... I think November thirtieth, because I wanted to get I wanted to get it done before Christmas. I, like it felt like you know finals before Christmas break. I wanted because <laughs> I knew it was going to be this dark, depressing thing. So I was like, oh, let's get it over with. It's very Christmasy. It has snow in it. <laughs> well, and here's why I say, in a sense, if it was a bit darker because you're actually seeing some of the, like the things she's fighting, and you know some descriptions like that, I'll you know just skim over. Here, you're actually seeing zombie like things and the whole scene in the sewers I thought was like really disturbing and like it doesn't really light up much on after that but on the other hand in the book you kind of get the sense that a lot of the rebels of the rebel forces are really just as bad in some ways as the capital people Mm -hmm. you know trying to get power and all this kind of stuff which it might might be true to the whole war is you know there's no easy answers sort of aspect of the stories but it leaves it very dour. Well, and the interesting thing about condensing it into a movie like this is that I felt like they focused a lot of the anim- the badness of the rebel side into the lady president. Which is a lot you have to do in a movie. Yeah, basically. You don't really get the same sense. And again, because you're not in Candace's head as much, yeah. you don't get the same sense of like all these people are horrible. And again, also because you're not in Candace's head as much, the, the epilogue feels a little bit more safer. It's yeah. a little bit happier and... Katniss and Peta are together and they have a kid. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely left me with kind of a somber note at the very end, but it wasn't as bad as it could be. So that's movie my two- sign. <laughs> movie sign. All right. So that's the movie I saw now for the movie that you saw that I didn't. And that is The Good Dinosaur. Good Dinosaur. First there thing you know, it is not inside out. Um, <laughs> no, but a lot of people, I, when I was looking at some reviews, they would say things like, oh, it's just kind of traditional or it's no inside out. Or, and- it's not, but what I I like the fact that it was very traditional. It was very much like an old school Disney movie in many ways, like a Milo and Otis, or a you know you just go out in the wilderness and you're you know and you have all these encounters and you get home and you're different than when you started. So I mean, it's not it's not breaking much ground, but it's really solid what it does, and I I thought it was quite enjoyable. How did you feel about the uh, scenery versus the characters? I, I I liked it. I didn't mind it at all. I I mean the scenery is gorgeous. Well, I mean, and I, I don't mind the the cartoony dinosaurs or anything. Okay. Um, I, it worked for me. I mean, maybe not for everyone, but I liked it. Um, the the caveman boy spot we said is basically my nephew Link. Um, <laughs> no, but was what also I thought was interesting. Feel I took feel to it, my son, um, and it's very in parts. I I want to say brutal, very just eat or be eaten sort of mentality is interesting they start at this farm and it's kind of safe and modern and they go out and it's wild out there and actually wild there's you know oh, okay. creatures trying to kill each other and things like this lion king type stuff yeah um and then he gets back and it's almost a subtext is that while he's out there he never becomes like all the other creatures out there he's still a, a good dinosaur i mean that's never said and never, it doesn't even it feels like it should be called the brave dinosaur but i really think it's called the good dinosaur because kind of neath under all this stuff is that he still has compassion for this boy and he still doesn't be like this sort of eat or be eaten mentality that's kind of running around out there. Okay. Would you say that it's more of a movie for kids, particularly younger kids, than say 
Inside Out? I don't know. I, I do think it's probably more... Oh, there we go. Well, finish it up. Okay. You thought. Um, I think it's more um, primal in its fears, like storms and stuff like that. So it's a little scarier, I think, for kids than Inside Out would be, which is over their head. But it's probably is meant more for kids as in total. Okay. Yeah. That's just kind of the, the vibe I've got. And, and I, want yeah. to, I want to see the movie. It just hasn't... And you know, partly because it's saving money, and it's, it just yeah. seems like one I might wait for movies. Yeah, I mean, it TV, just is a really but... solid movie, and I like the fact, I know I'm way over time now, I like the fact that Pixar doesn't mind just trying something different, even if it's different is just more normal. Yeah. But, <laughs> the, but, but it's not normal in the sense of, like, a normal movie nowadays is super funny and crazy and stuff, and mm-hmm. it's just old school. Interesting. All right. On a similar note, that's what I would call the Peanuts movie. Man, I love the Peanuts movie. Um, I, you know, this is one that had a lot of cause to be a little worried when I first heard they were going to do a uh, computer animated Peanuts movie because, you know, that's a completely different style than it had ever been done in. But they took that style and they made it work for them. And I, I love that we're in this era now where you can do computer graphics and it doesn't all have to be like realistic yeah. or anything like that. We've come far enough that we can kind of bend it to our will instead of having to always, you know, bow to what looks good for a computer. Yeah. I mean, it almost looks, well, it's funny because, you know, they use this very limited kind of 2D perspective to kind of co- copy the comic book look. But because it's 3D creatures, it almost kind of has a stop motion quality to it. Interesting. Um, and I guess I heard somewhere that they actually didn't animate as many frames as they would normally. Oh, really? To kind of, again, to kind of emulate that, you know, okay. more of a hand drawn kind of feel to it. That's cool. So they did a lot of really neat tricks. And what's even more important is that they didn't. Again, they they told an old fashioned story. They didn't modernize things too much, which well, was the, my fear going into it that they just update it yeah. to be all hip. Yeah, and not only did, and Charlie Brown can't be hip. No, no, and not only did they not like make it all hip and have lots of them wisecracks and things like that, but it was they went so far as to even like no one uses cell phones. No one like there's no like no technology. It all feels very timeless. At least, you know, the this, this sort of timelessness that we hope continues. Yeah. And the story is is really cool. If I had one complaint is I wish that there was a little more time spent with something. Because it focuses pretty majorly on Charlie Brown and Snoopy. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's fun stuff. But maybe if there was one less of, there's a lot of, ah, I turned the timer up. <laughs> uh, it, there's a lot of fantasy sequences of Snoopy fighting the Red Baron, yeah. which are fun. Um, but I feel like if there's like maybe one less, you could have gotten a little bit more time with some of the other well, characters, even sense. though a lot of the other characters had some good moments. I'll go ahead and go next. Go um, for it. Where I we... watched Minority Report. Oh, um, yes. I haven't this seen season. this show. Yeah. And at first, I'm like, ah, whatever. Natasha wouldn't watch it. I'm like, ah, I'll try it. I thought it was just going to be basically like a uh, person of interest in the future you know he can see murders before they happen but not quite all the information they have to go stop the murder and etc uh-huh. and it starts off that way but they pretty couple episodes in they really started moving the formula around i mean it always ends up being a sea of vision try to stop the murder i mean that but they play with it a lot okay um and the best thing i think that really made it work is first off the guy who plays dash which is the main precog okay um, it, li- it it continues from the movie in theory i mean it, it credits spielberg and everything uh-huh. Is that he's a he's just a very likable, interesting character, and then he has his brother and his sister who were all the other two precogs. They're all released and they're living normal lives. Okay, and the family dynamics and the characterization of the fam of the different siblings really works. And I think besides being pretty clever in some of the ways they changed up the whole oh no the murder sort of thing and having a pretty good kind of overarching plot line. Is really those three siblings, their interactions to each other and their history together and the different ways they've decided to deal with being gone and dealing with their years in the milk bath made it worth watching. And then the the guy who was their tech, um, what's his, I can't even remember his name now. He's great. I mean, so the character, the characters were a lot of fun and the stories avoided being repetitious. So I was, I was pretty pleased with it. Is that on Fox? It was on, I don't remember, I watched it on Hulu. Oh. So I don't know. <laughs> So are you all cut up with it? or? Yeah, I think it's over for the... It may be over for unless good. they renew it. I don't know. Oh, okay. I mean, it was one of those endings that's like an ending, but there could obviously be a lot more. Okay. You don't really follow Arrow Flash much, no. do you? So I'll go ahead and do that. It may, might be unfair to kind of combine both of these, but I don't have a whole lot to say, except I did think I really dug the uh, Arrow winter finale or mid-season finale, whichever you prefer. They seem to be interchangeable, but 
both of these shows I don't love as much as some people do. I enjoy mm-hmm. watching them. Um, I do feel sometimes they some of their story beats get a little too soap opera y for my taste. I mean, that's CW. That's yeah. part, I think that's some of that rubbing off on them. But Arrow finale, I thought, did. I do like the villain that they have. Honestly, the main villain they have for both shows this season is very strong. And I'm glad Arrow got a better one than they had last year. But it was a very cool, like, actual high stakes going on and a lot of, you know, characters' lives on the line. It'll be really interesting to see what what they do with it because Flash didn't really... Well, they had a bit of a cliffhanger, but it was a huge one. Yeah. But Arrow's traditionally the darker show, and it certainly was in this time. I'm really curious if they're going to wind up killing a uh, fan favorite or not. Oh. Ooh, yes. My gut is no. I think they're they're purposely trying to misdirect the audience, but it, it would be possible. And I, and I just have to say that probably the highlight in the Flash mid-season finale for me is seeing Mark Hamill as the trickster again. Nice. Because <laughs> he he's basically doing a live-action Joker. I mean, let's be honest. That's yeah. basically what it is. There might be little differences, but that's basically what we're going to see. And what we want to see. And Yeah, exactly. That's totally what we want to see. I, I, I still hope, I'd love to see him actually play the Joker someday, but if not, this is second best, yeah. and so that, that's pretty fun. And I got to say, man, uh, Jesse Martin, who plays his stepdad, basically, okay. is great. <laughs> I always, I always love watching any scene with him. So should we do S.H.I.E.L.D.? Yes, we'll do the shows we have both watched now. So this will be interesting, us both trying yeah. to talk about S.H.I.E.L.D. real quick. And go. Okay, first off, S.H.I.E.L.D. this season has been on fire. It has been amazing. Honestly, for my money, it's the best comic book show on TV yeah. right now. I, I mean, don't watch and, the other one. So and I say that more as a DC fanboy, but man, S.H.I.E.L.D. has been awesome. I'll tell you what, every episode they up the stakes, they move things forward. At the beginning of the season, they're like... Like five plot lines, and like they're juggling all these, and then they pull them all together in like in it, one thing. And you're like, what? And it seems f- seamless. Like it, they're not forcing these things the, together. That it all felt very natural. All the characters, all characters have good motivations. They're all doing interesting things. They're all changing. They don't feel like they're annoying them just to be dumb. And it's amazing too how many like different comic booky type things they can cram into this. I mean, not only do you have spies, but you also have people with power, superpowers, yeah. and then they've got this the portal thing, thing and the going to outer space and you know, entire episode. Okay, this thing has been plotted very well this season. Yeah, they there's are not, firing in all cylinders. There's not a lot of shows that are plotted that well. Yeah, no, I, I would That I'm agree. watching at least. <laughs> Now, well, I don't want to say much about the finale episode. I would uh, go ahead. You, but you haven't seen. That's it fine. Yet. I'll say there. There's a quasi ending for Ward. Okay. That I wasn't completely satisfied with. I'm not. A, wasn't opposed to losing Rosalind. Yeah. Um, but it felt kind of sad to see Coulson go into full revenge mode, where oh. he's usually kind of the wise cracking kind of yeah. kind of guy. Um, seeing him go like real dark like that was a little sad. I mean, yeah. I I don't blame the writers at all for yeah. it. I mean, it it all worked pretty well. But I just hope Coulson doesn't lose his uh, humanity in yeah. the process. If that makes sense, not just his arm. Yeah. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> uh, so there we go. Nice. And finally, um, Muppets. You're going to oh, get yes. Muppets, Tim. A Muppets. Um, well, I could do a whole half hour. Actually, I will probably t- I'll probably do another vlog. If you didn't see my last vlog, I did a vlog kind of before, before the show. everything. Yeah, I'll probably do another another vlog before the when before it comes back in February, yeah. just to talk about things. But uh, the last episode of that was perfect. They've been improving ever yeah. since. They've been readjusting this here and there. It's, it's much more Muppety than it started out with. It's not mm-hmm. quite so crass. Not quite so. Biting. Yeah, and it wasn't. It wasn't really like even the first episodes were horrible. No. in any ways, it was. It wasn't. You know, some of the worst shows on TV. It was just little things that made it feel like, huh? These don't fit quite right. Yeah, and, and my guess is that they were doing sort of a overcorrection. They wanted to do this more grown-up show, not you know, keeping it family friendly, yeah. but purposely communicating to everyone's like, hey, we are not just for little kids. Yeah. We are purposely trying to do these other things. And they probably overcorrected a yeah. little bit, made the characters a little too mean to each other. Yeah. But lately they've been, you know, they can they can be 
snarky and stuff without losing heart. Yeah, and they've been they've been hitting it perfectly in both marks. And they they a lot of the characters get to shine. I've never seen the band so much. They've they've <laughs> been a blast. Well, I mean, and that's one of the advantages of having the Muppets on a TV show. You in a movie and even you know commercial appearances, it's you come in big, Piggy and Fozzie. And yeah, you you only get a chance to hit the the major characters. You need more time, like on a show like this, to be able to have. You know, development with Scooter. When have you we seen so much stuff with Scooter? I know. I think they're overdoing the Mama's Boy aspect a bit. But he's still a lot of fun. And and man, Uncle Deadly has, <laughs> has taken on a new life. <laughs> Uncle Deadly's so great. Uh, props to the uh, the performers, the mm-hmm. the puppeteers, because they they're a lot of them. You know, there's a couple that were on the original Muppet Show, but a lot of them are all new care, all the new guys, yeah. and they've. Shut up. They've taken on the role and just done fantastic jobs with it. And so what Tim is saying is if you're not watching it, start watching it. Yes, absolutely. Um, buy Hulu Plus if you haven't watched all of it and just yeah. to watch those or get a free trial or whatever. Probably the last five episodes are still free. Yeah, um, probably. So go, and go those are, yeah, watch it. It's certainly a lot of fun. All right. One last thing to talk about in our Take on Tales frenzy here. Frenzy. And that is Star Wars. I'm not going to put a timer on this one. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be here all night. (laughs) No, I'll keep an eye on the clock. But I just wanted to, you know, I plan to see the movie in a, we're only a week away from seeing it. That's true. That's true. And I just thought it'd be fun to talk about some things that we hope to see from it. You know, honestly, I have not thought too much about it. Well, that's probably a good thing. (laughs) Now, the one thing I remember reading somewhere, and I I do, not that I'll care either way, but I do hope that there's a lot of new stuff and not just new versions of old stuff. Yeah, that is that is a concern I kind of have because even though they say apparently the desert we keep seeing in previews is not Tatooine, it's someplace called Jakku, it, it's still kind of the same, kind of feels like it's starting off with the same idea, like they're going to start on a desert planet and then go into space. So I hope it's not, yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. But I'm pretty excited. I mean, the previews are all great. I think it'll mm-hmm. be fun to see. Just a little bit of seeing these new characters look like they'll be a, a lot of fun. I don't really know what I'm going to get at all, and I've been trying to stay away from too much yeah, spoiler personally. No, I have two. I know Kathleen Kennedy, the president of Lucasfilm now, uh, said that the movie is still very focused on the Skywalker family. They, She said that's still going to be kind of the center of the main Star Wars movies. Yeah. The fact that we have like spinoff Star Wars movies is still bizarre to me. Yeah. But I like I like that she said it's still on the well, and everyone's thinking one of those guys has to be related to Skywalker somehow. Probably, yeah, probably the uh, Ray. Ray, yeah, most likely she's, she does have a she has a strong um, Padme vibe. Yeah, she really does. The other th- main thing that and where's I, Luke? <laughs> yes, where's Luke on the flash? Apparently. <laughs> well, the other I was gonna say the other main thing that I'm really hoping for these is. You know, everyone wants them to kind of copy the original trilogy feel to it, which is cool. But I also hope they don't lose the spirit of of the ending of Return of the Jedi, yeah. which was always my main concern with the extended universe in general, in that you sort of lost the happily never ever after feel to it when you got the sense that their lives just went completely horribly, you know, yeah. la- later on. I think the first thing that made me... Yeah, one of the first things that made me really start thinking this way is I remember reading a comic that was sort of a collection of sort of an anthology, but it was a collection of stories about C-3PO and R2-D2 going around and collecting testimonials from people after Chewbacca died. Okay, yeah. Which was a thing that happened in the extended universe. You know, they would go to each of the characters and they'd tell, you know, kind of a story. And it was all very, very sad. But one of the saddest ones was when they went to Leia. And she talked about how much, in some ways, she got to be jealous of Chewbacca, and that he and Han had this thing that she could, she was he, she was never really part of their world. And as she got more involved in politics, she and Han were growing farther apart. And she it just talked about all these stresses on her job. And she was yeah. like, "Okay, don't record. You know, now that I'm I've done kind of venting all that, I'm going to record my actual yeah. you know, story." And she put on her very you know royal public persona, and just made me feel so sad for these people. Yeah. That like, and I don't. I, I'm I'm totally fine with you know. Obviously, there being you know other things. The Babylon Five effect. There yeah. being other things they have to work with. The drop. Yeah, but I don't want them to feel like the galaxy has never had a moment of peace in the past thirty years. I mean, hopefully, or that Luke has gone evil. I don't want to see that at all. I mean, what I, I guess on the same line, most like you know, people say, oh, the sec- first ones are like second ones, or what? You know, the prequels aren't like the originals, and what? But 
both the prequels and the originals have this sense of kind of larger than life, kind of mythic events. Yeah. And I guess I would most, you saying that makes me think, hopefully these new movies still keep that sense of larger than life mythic events and not trying to do a realistic Star Wars. Right. Now, there might be room for a spin-off realistic Star Wars, but that these main movies should not be They it. should not be it. I mean, I'm, I might be okay with anthology movies doing, you know, and, and I've come to learn, too, like, Star Wars can do a lot of different kind of vibes. It's, it's had to learn when you have, like, a hundred and some books. You, yeah. you learn to do things. Yeah, but I agree. The main Star Wars movies should have those bigger-than-life things. And for, You know, because the whole idea why it tapped into it, because it, it is like a myth. It's like a modern, you know... You fairy know, tale. Touchstone. Fairy tale. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in it always worked better than new me. ones. Yeah. I was, Star Wars was always my favorite when it was space fantasy as opposed to hard or sci fi. Yeah. Space fantasy. Space opera. Uh, space yeah. opera. Yeah. As opposed to hard sci fi. Now, it does, uh, we both read that article with J.J. Uh, Abrams when he and Kazadin mm-hmm. both said they wanted the movie to be delightful. Yes. And if that's true, if it delighted them, yeah. That's that's what we're going for. Yes, that I totally agree. That made me that made me hopeful when I read that because yeah, yeah I, I don't want a like uber gritty dark Star Wars. I want and it'll, delightful. Yeah, and and hopefully it'll be the bad guys should be they can be they can be complicated, but they should be not realistic. I mean, the right type of realistic. No, no, yeah, they should be complicated, but not that sort of like super gray torture. You know, just like more comic booky. Yeah, I guess. that sounds horrible. But, but yeah, you, you know, know it I mean. when you see it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that was our whirlwind take on Tales. And if that doesn't have you exhausted enough, we're still going to go into the weird world of... What if... We've been talking Star Wars. In case you don't know, Star Wars is everywhere. Star Wars? Star what? What's Star Wars? Star Wars. What, why is there this battle in the space? Star Wars. Star Wars. Star Wars. Um, you can't watch a commercial about cars or batteries or diapers or anything without Star Wars showing up. I think I saw uh, the actress who plays Daisy on Shield. She yeah. tweeted the other day. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some Star Wars themed tampons commercial yeah, pretty I, soon. Yeah. So you know, which led you I, to think. Well, maybe well, not that tweet. But. Well, no, I didn't see that tweet, but it made me think, what needs to be Star Wars that isn't yet? And is there anything that yes. isn't Star Wars yet? We might have to Amazon. So we're going to go to Amazon. It. And I was telling Tim before we started recording that there's a Darth Vader toaster. That it's a Darth Vader's head. And you put toast in it and it comes out um, in ho- probably a little darker than normal. And, um, <laughs> and, there's, and there's that uh, shower head, right? With Zach has now. Water comes out of Darth Vader's eyes. Yep. Mm-hmm. That is true. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they have a, a Zach and Brianna who have a, a, Darth, a R2D2 trash can now. They have a BB8 cookie jar, uh, which is amazing. BB8 is probably the most marketable character of a movie that, you know, like even before I know. that hasn't even come out yet. I mean, whatever Disney paid for Star Wars, I don't remember now. They probably made back already in merchandise, and the movie's not even out yet. Well, they paid like a billion dollars, I think. Well, then after <laughs> this movie, it'll be paid back. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, honestly, pretty much a billion dollars is nothing compared to a couple years of Star Wars merchandise and movies. Yeah. Okay, so Tim, what? Because, you know, there used to be C-3PO's. I don't know if they've ever brought those back. The cereal? The cereal. <laughs> I don't think so. Um, so what is not Star Wars yet that we can make Star Wars? Um, a toilet plunger. Look it up. Okay. <laughs> so this is it came from interwebs, too. Yeah, um, that's true. Well, but it's probably somewhere you else. Know, well, let's see. There's a Star Wars toilet cover, apparently. Okay. You know, if they made a toilet plunger, it needs to be shaped like the, that thing in the um, trash compactor. Like this tentacle thing. <laughs> That would be awesome. Now, you realize if we were prequel haters, we probably would say you'd have to look like Jar Jar. Oh, that's true. <laughs> that's what, that's, that's true. what some people would want. Okay, there does not seem to be that. Although, yes, we got one. So, okay, but although there is also a Star Wars toilet vinyl decal, so if, in case you want Darth Vader like on the back side of the, <laughs> of the not All the right. seat, but you know, the lid. Yeah, the the lid. lid, okay. Um, okay. There's also a Star Wars uh, Darth Vader bath mat. Okay. And uh, Han and Leia hand towels. Oh, uh, Zach and Brandon have those. One <laughs> says, I love you. The other one says, I know. <laughs> Okay, yeah, that that's what I see here. Yep. That's that's brilliant. So okay, okay so no plunger yet. So right. guys, you're missing out on a vast a, market. A, a mi- here. Minor market of plundering. <laughs> you need to plunge right into it. Pl- <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Okay. Uh, before we, it goes down the drain. Uh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm gonna uh, stop that up right now. <laughs> <laughs> that is genius. 
All right, what else we got? Okay, okay. I'm trying to look around, and everything I see around here could be Star Wars already. Okay, I thought of a waffle maker that's coming up. Oh, right there's away. they're they're gonna have that's not even <laughs> it's not even close. That's not even close. Come on, <laughs> we need um Star Wars um something just you don't think of very often. So that's why I'm not thinking of it. Well, the problem is looking around a house. They probably you they know, have done everything in the house. In the house, most likely. Um, lawnmower, Star Wars lawnmower. Okay, there you go. Let's see, Star Wars lawnmower, lawn ornament. Uh, I am not seeing a Star Wars lawnmower. Awesome. So what? What if you were making Star Wars lawnmower? What do you do? I mean, obviously you just take a normal one and you you put. Although now that you mention it, let me. I'm gonna actually Google Star Wars lawnmower. Oh, I bet someone's made one. Someone's probably made one. They may not be selling one yet, but probably someone's. Let's see. I'm just gonna do an image search here. See, there's a stormtrooper on a lawnmower. There's Darth Vader pushing a mower. No, I don't Ooh. see. I don't see an adjusted one. There's a Pinterest project for you. All right. So, what do you make of a Star Wars lawnmower? I think you got to make an X-wing. An X-wing? Or, or you are you talking about speeder pusher bike. riding? A uh, riding one. Riding. Okay. Maybe actually, not, not an X-wing. A speeder bike. Speeder bike. That's I, where you got to go. I think. I, I think you're right. You I got. Okay. You Get go on that Disney. Bike. Come on. <laughs> Because Actually, I'm surprised no one's made that. I see a Batmobile lawnmower here, apparently, but no Star Wars. Yeah, what are they thinking? At least not in my quick Google. I image mean, search. look, while you're mowing the lawn, you guys still have Star Wars. Exactly, everything Star Wars, Star everything, Wars all the time, Star Wars all the time, <laughs> Star Wars Stardust. Let's see what else. What are good Star Wars things? Star Wars wedding dress. Okay, well we saw there was that one girl at Zach's wedding. Uh, had the had the skirt with the dark stormtroopers on it. Yeah, it was like it was like this ballerina sort of skirt, and it had stormtroopers. It was crazy. <laughs> the Google search brought up like some people cosplaying in at a wedding, which you know that happens. Yeah. Um, I see some Star Wars related dresses, not specifically wedding. So, though. so that's a possibility. Although now, you know, maybe yeah. all you have to do though is yeah. Oh, here's here's a dress. It looks like uh, it's Padme's. Wedding oh, from. Dress. Oh, no, 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 no. I think I might just She has that nice white dress at the end of Phantom Menace, doesn't she? Mm-hmm. What? what, what? <laughs> okay, okay, take a look at this picture here, okay. Nick. I, I don't... It, it, okay, describe that for our audience, <laughs> Okay, so the, if you can. the uh the person presiding over the ceremony is in a is a woman in a Slave Leia outfit, and it, it appears to be a couple <laughs> dressed up as, respectively, Mon Mothma and Admiral Akbar. That's awesome. Which <laughs> reminds me, brilliant. if they don't have it yet, they need mouse traps with Admiral Akbar on it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me that exists. I, I'm gonna. I'm looking that up right this now. This feels like Family Feud. Like, <laughs> let me see mouse traps. Ding 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 ding. Two <laughs> percent of the people that, that does exist. An okay. Admiral Akbar mouse trap. It, it does. Otherwise, I, now I don't know. I'm looking at the Google image search. Yeah. I don't know if that's an actual product. Let me see. It's got to be an actual product. Come on now. Nope. Oh, at see, least not on Amazon anyway. See Amazon. <laughs> now you know what I've always wanted. This is an actual true thing. I've always wanted a full CD of Cantina band music. <laughs> I'm serious. Not just those two songs. They want like a 12, 13, 14 track thing from the model nodes. Okay. Figuring down the model nodes. You need to do a skit down, get recorded. <laughs> that stuff is awesome. What's their name? Don't they, don't they have an actual band name? Yeah, it's Figuring Dan and the mod, Model Nodes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Or Moto Nodes. I don't know. But uh, I'll take your word on it. Yep. You're a little harder core than I am. Well, I remember reading back the, the oh, Tell Us from Cantina. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I never read that they, one. They don't do weddings. Okay. We're running long here, Nick. So okay. we should we should jump to what what was your idea for the Star Wars Purist? The F Star Wars Purist. So here's what we get for their Kill Christmas gift. Hunt down an original version of New Hope. Which, without all the additional things. Actually, have you ever heard of the despecialized editions? Do they have one? Well, not officially. My, my parents still have copies. There's a fan edit out there that is like, not only is it like, it's like a HD version of Star Wars. But they took all the... They took all the special edition stuff out of it, and they they like, the amount of detail they went to it, like there's, I saw some YouTube video on it, is insane. Wow. Like the amount of Okay, so get, get a version of that. Yeah. And you basically just that movie because everything else is extra. <laughs> um, oh, only I, a new, only a new only hope. a new hope uh -huh. and Splinter of the Mind's Eye, and that's <laughs> that's the package. <laughs> 
<laughs> so you don't have all this extra stuff that's been added on later. Splinter of the Mind died. <laughs> Only the originals are any good. <laughs> and maybe and maybe some of the comic strips back from the newspapers, like the Marvel or the Marvel yeah. comics. Yeah. yeah, you know, like just none of this newfangled Star Wars stuff. <laughs> Timothy Zahn, too new, too new. Too new. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys don't know, Splinter of the Mind's Eye is. I think I've complained about it on here before. Alan Dean Foster is the first book written of Star Wars before Empire Strikes Back comes out. After Star Wars, and it's very interesting what they think might happen. I mean, it's, between Luke and Leia. Well, and then other it's things. Kinda, just and the Force is weird, and Darth Vader's weird, oh, and it's, oh, it's such a terrible book. <laughs> but, but it's it's what it might have looked like before they started adding things. <laughs> I mean, so you're saying include that because Timothy Zahn is just too new. new Timothy family. Zahn's way too new. Come on, <laughs> he started out the Clone Wars, and that gave us the prequels. So. <laughs> But nothing to do with that. Only, only the vintage original. Maybe stuff. Empire Strikes Back, just because. Because it's the it, best movie. Because it's the best movie. Yeah. Not Return of the Jedi. No. Because it's got those dummy it, walks. It, it, it. Yes. Yeah. So really, <laughs> Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, and then you end in that sad note, and you just you just linger there. <laughs> You're like, yes, darkness, hand cut off. <laughs> That's the Star Wars I grew up with. The Star Wars I grew to love. I'm not sure this is really for the Star Wars purist or if it's just for the Star Wars trolls. It's, it's for the trolls, I think. <laughs> like the, all the curmudgeon people <laughs> that, yeah. Should we wrap in there? Just if you're going to be a purist, we'll just throw the Christmas special in just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> I life don't know. day, everyone. Life day. <laughs> no. Everyone needs lumpy. <laughs> If you're going to include that, then maybe we'll give them a, a copy of the uh, Star Wars Muppet Show episode to kind of tie it over. Okay, okay. You know. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. And nothing else. No Jar Jar, none of these Ewok things. Nope. None of this Mara Jade, Luke being mad, happily married stuff. No. Happily ever after. Pfft. Admiral Thrawn, dumbest thing I ever heard of. <laughs> cool Yoda Jedi guys. Uh, who cares? All right. Okay. Well, we're, we're, we're good. That's enough of that. <laughs> that's enough of that. Okay. So, so thank you for listening to uh, Derailed Trains of Thought, episode 62. If you uh, haven't listened to our previous episodes or you heard us talking about Weekly Hijack and you're like, what is that? Well, Nick, where can they find all this stuff? They can find that on the internet. Okay. At uh, <laughs> derailedtrainsofthought.blogspot.com is our main landing site. We also have uh, our episodes on YouTube. I need to probably a little behind in terms of actual episodes. I've been keeping up with Weekly Hijack, but maybe during the uh, hiatus here. And then iTunes is how I get all that. my episodes. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that's the easiest way to do it, probably. Yeah. And leave us leave us reviews, starred ratings on iTunes so other people can hear our wondrous voices. And uh, be better for it. Yes. All right. Well, we should... Let's see. I've got a soundtrack here I need to bring up. I think everyone's heading over to this house and, like, there's some sort of party going on and bells ringing and stuff. Oh, yeah? Go, yeah. They, yeah, nice old house. Maybe we can go over there and That's, drop some That sounds off. good. Yeah, they're playing Old Lang Sign. Which is always great, yeah. It's, it's very nice. All right, for my soundtrack, I found this today, actually. I was looking for I was looking for Christmas music for something else, and I came across this on OC Remix. It's actually just from last year. It's called Fisherman's Horizon, Christmas version. It is a remix from Final Fantasy VIII, and it was done by Gumin Nam, which sounds mm. like a Star Wars name. Yes, it does. I don't know if it's his actual name, but if not, you should go move into Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> Which pretty soon everyone will be Star Wars. Yeah, the, Star like, Wars. There'll be whole cities named Tatooine. And Basically. I'm surprised there actually, that hasn't it happened probably yet. probably is. I mean, honestly. if there's a religion out there based on Star Wars, then why not a, a town? There's probably some sort of dark cult following Jar Jar. And <laughs> they say Jar Jar is actually a Sith Lord. I saw and, that. Have I you saw seen that, that theory? Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, since we've been talking Star Wars all this, we might actually wind up doing a sidetracks with our uh, reactions to it. Yeah. But in the meantime... It won't just be screaming, I don't think. Like, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> in the meantime, we hope you have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New yes, Year. Enjoy. And, and a Happy Life Day. Happy Life Day. No, don't. Don't have a nice <laughs> Life Day. Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> this has been Tim. This has been Nick. Bye.